Welcome back to another episode of the Randy Wilson Podcast. I'm your host, Randy Wilson. It has been a little while. I have been enjoying life and spring break with my family, but I am back today with another phenomenal guest, Sonia Shelton, and we're going to talk to her about her business and her career and all the great things that she's doing. But before we do that, make sure if you are new to the show that you subscribe to the show and follow the show so you can become familiar with the Randy Wilson Podcast. You can find this podcast everywhere podcasts are played. You can also go over to randywilsonpodcast.com to learn more about the show. We are in the hundreds somewhere, Sonia. I'm not exactly sure anymore. I stopped numbering and stopped counting, but we're in the hundreds. You know, probably like if we had to put a number on this episode, it's probably like 117, but we've probably done 150. Sometimes it all depends on where they fall because some episodes are emergency episodes. You know, we got to get them out, but we're very excited to have you on the show, Sonia. And uh, let's get right on into Sonia's bio, which is very impressive. Um, when it comes to navigating the ins and outs of business, Sonia Shelton has seen it all from successful startups with brand new ideas to well-established fortune 500 companies. Sonia Shelton founded executive leadership consulting in 2007 from her passion for partnering with leaders and high achievers to create a clear vision and build work environments where employees are fulfilled and completely committed to their organization's success. She has captured her leadership tips and success stories in her number one amazing best-selling book, You're an Executive, But Are You a Leader? Having been an executive as well as an international speaker and consultant, Sonia knows how to tap into her lesser-known hidden practices that drive true leadership. Her philosophy, background, and experience add a strategic, pragmatic, and multidimensional approach to making strong leaders. Sonia serves on the Forbes Coaches Council and is certified master corporate executive coach through the Association of Corporate Executive Coaches. What a bio, Sonia. I'm sweating. Thank you. Thank I'm you. I'm so excited to be here and looking forward to our conversation. I am too. You know, what's very interesting, folks, today is April the, let me get it right. Today is April the 18th. We are recording on April 18th. And Sonia was actually scheduled to be in Richmond, Virginia this past weekend. What a coincidence. And and you until you checked out my show, you probably wasn't even aware that I was from, oh, I lived in Richmond, did you? That's true. That's true. I was, I was laughing at the coincidence. <laughs> well, I, I tell you what, I'm not, I, I tell you what, I'm not going to laugh about here. This is very serious. I get a lot of emails from folks about potential shows, potential episodes. And a lot of them are just not intriguing to me. They're not. But you were the first one through the person who coordinated, booked us that I've ever done that way. You're the first one. And what stood out to me that made me interested in having a conversation was a couple of things. First off, I just got back from Disney. Okay. I was spending time in Disney with my family. Um, and I, I noticed that you worked at Disney and I've all, always been curious about talking to someone who had worked at Disney because when I think about Disney, it's, it's, it's obviously like one of the biggest brands in the world, but I've always heard like interesting, great things about how they treat their employees and their professional development opportunities and I've heard great things. So I wanted, I, I was curious to ask some questions about that. And when I look at your career, you know, you start, you, you, you was at Disney in the early 2000s. I think you started there and you worked there for seven years and I'm sure you grew a lot. So I'm, I, I will get into asking you questions about that experience and how that moved over. But, um, Another reason I was interested in having a conversation with you is because just the work that you do, the work that you do is so complimentary in the work that I do in my daytime work. Um, obviously the name of the company, executive leadership consultants, correct? Mm -hmm. first, first question, just right there. Like what was it hard to get that name? Because <laughs> that's, there's a lot of people who can say, I mean, that's a phenomenal name. A lot of people can say, I am an executive leadership consultant, but you got the name and I'm a, so how, like, was that hard to get? <laughs> it was hard to get our domain for sure. I, would um, I, I actually had to, to purchase it, but it wasn't, it wasn't that expensive. Fortunately, somebody was just sitting on it. Um, but I, I think it's, uh, yeah, I, th I think what I was looking at the name of the company, I was really looking at, you know, just saying what we do. Right. Instead of coming up with some catchy name or, or naming it after me, 
uh, just having just being straight up and say this is this is what we do. We are, we're we help executives with their leadership. We help them create companies that are great places to work. Um, so why not just call it executive leadership consulting? That's what we do. And 17 years later, if I'm correct, you've been you've had this business for 17 years. Am I correct? Uh, yeah. Well, it's about uh, I think 15. 15? About 15. Mm-hmm. Well, that I mean, it's phenomenal. Um, yeah. So. Let me ask you this question. Like in, in 2023, I, I used to have a consulting business and I, and I had it for almost four years, but I never got it to the point where I could be sustainable based off that income. And so I want to start here. I'm, I'm really curious, like you've obviously built a strong, you had a solid foundation coming into building your company and you've, you're definitely, you, you're, I, I would imagine you're in a great maintenance stage now. I mean, you're, you're a best-selling author. You're very well-established. You're a Forbes coach. And I'm going to ask you a little bit more about what that is. It sounds like money. Okay. To be honest with you, Forbes coach <laughs> sounds like a pretty good, cool situation to be in. But I'm curious in 2023, I tend to find that a lot of businesses are often reluctant to use consulting. You know, consulting is a, a lot of, the reason that a person would use consulting is because they need they, they know what they need or they don't know what they need, but typically it's a specialized area of focus that only a person who is a specialist with specific committed time can typically, um, often the best person to, to do it. So you, you, you oftentimes use consulting versus using an employee in the area because you're looking for something outside of the ordinary and, and you don't, you don't want to take away from your employees focus on what their, their job duties are. So, when it comes to consulting, talk to me a little bit about the profile of the type of folks that you work with uh, and how how your work has changed over the years. Um, because, you know, do people use it more now, less now? I'm kind of curious. Yeah, I think that so so we work with companies of varying sizes, as you mentioned in my bio. So we don't really look at a demographic um, kind of company. We look more at uh, what kind of company are they, right? So are they a company who really wants to grow and that they understand the power of their people in making that growth, right? So so what you're saying about, you know, not hiring a consultant because their employees can do it, totally agree. And, and, and I've worked with, um, I've worked side by side with a lot of the really big consulting firms that uh, I think most people think of when they think of consulting, right? They come in, they cost a lot of money, right? Right, and they don't really do much, or they, or they, um, they come up with the, these ideas that that ends up getting put in a file, and and they leave, and and the company doesn't really know how to implement. When we and the way that we do consulting is a little bit different. So we we I say, um, you know, a fish can't see its own water, right? So a lot of what we do is connecting the business strategy with your employee culture, so that you can grow, right? So, so, but you can't really see what your culture is from the inside. You can only somebody from the outside can really look at what's happening in the culture and things like that because you're in it, right? So you can't really see what what um what all the dimensions of it are. So, so really, we really look at partnering with companies who want to grow, who maybe they don't know how to grow, but they know um, they know they want to. They 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 might have a vision. They might not have a vision. We help them create that clarity and really getting clear about what is their purpose as a company. Why do they do what they do? How do they bring that why to life? And then what can others expect from them? So starting with their purpose and then connecting that purpose through everything that they do, from their plan to their processes to their positions to their passion, passionate culture, right? everything that they do. And we call that red thread leadership. So really um, connecting that red thread from their purpose through everything that they do can help them grow faster and actually um, create a great place to work in the process, right? So I think it's not just about profits. It's a, we, we look at that, right? It's not that profits aren't important. They are. But your people can actually help you get to your profits faster than even you could probably imagine. And so... What's your thought on this? You know, we're in a, we are in a time now that um, a lot of the workforce is changing. I mean, that's, 
that's neither here or there. Of course, everyone knows that. But to me, it seems like post-COVID, depending on how you see it, some people think we're still in it. I don't know, but I'm gonna say we're I'm gonna say we're out of it. I'm gonna say we're pat, we're moving forward with life. And some people are challenged with moving forward and moving back into the workplace and working. Like I know in the healthcare industry, when I talk to a lot of peers in different companies in different places, we're challenged right now of finding enough people to work. I almost mm -hmm. think that people don't want to work a little bit. Okay. And companies are experiencing, have experienced a lot of turnover too. And so my question to you is, um, if you think, if you look at a company or with companies now that have had so much turnover, so much change since COVID, is it fair to say that some companies, even though they exist, they may not have a culture? Well, every company has a culture. So, well, so I, culture I'm, really. I'm, I'm asking that. And the reason I'm pushing back on that is because some companies have turned over hundred percent of their employees. So, yeah. so I, I'm curious, like when you, I want you to get deep into what defining culture, because if you've had turnover, it's such a tremendous amount of folks. I'm curious of like what you call that. When I think about culture, it almost sounds like bacteria. It sounds like something that should stick, you know, and if right. people ain't sticking around, <laughs> you know, it's like, so go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, so, and we, and you see this in the news, right. Where, where people are talking about why people are leaving companies it's often because they have a toxic culture, right? So, so every company has a culture. It's just about whether or not they're managing that culture and they're leading that culture and they're driving that culture to their benefit. They're leveraging it, or if they're just letting it happen organically, right? So new people come in, absolutely can change the culture. They still have one, right? The new people can come in and change the culture. And if you're not guiding that culture and driving it and showing people what it's like to work here, what are our values? What do we stand for? What, what is, what is, um, what is our purpose? Why are we passionate about that purpose? And what's your role in that purpose? And, and how can we connect your passion and your, your why to that, to that, to our purpose so that you're excited about coming to work. And I think a lot of people are, and I hear this a lot, especially with the young generations, um, they don't want to work, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> right. They would rather not work. They're not motivated. Um, and I really don't believe that's true. I think that the younger generations just won't put up with it. They won't put up with not having clear direction. They won't put up with their work not having meaning, right? And and um, and I think it's even happening with, you mentioned the workplace changes from COVID. You know, um, we had the experience of working from home in a lot of industries and and now companies are pushing employees to go back to work and it's like to go back into the office. And I think that... Um, you know, employees are saying, well, but why? If I can do my job from home, what am I coming into work for? And so the pushback isn't about whether or not they want to work. The pushback is, do they understand why they're doing what they're doing? So um, sometimes I hear, well, you know, they're asking us to come into the office four days a week um, in instead of three or, or instead of working from home. But then when I show up, I'm still on Zoom or I'm, st I'm still having video meetings all day because some people are there, some people aren't there. So why am I here, right? It's not that there's increased collaboration. So I think leaders need to really look at, you know, the purpose behind why they're doing what they're doing and explaining that to people and helping them connect their strengths and their superpower to what they're trying to do is really how you're going to get people to stay and how you're going to get them motivated to join your company. When you... um couple of questions here on that. When you, I think it's very, I think it, we've all been able to kind of see the benefits of working from home, you know, across the board, whether it's the balance or, you know, being, being home, just being home. Um, some people more efficient, some people maybe not, but I think it's easy to talk about the, the pros. What, what would you, what do you see as pros for those people who have had to return back to the workplace? What, what, what pros do you feel like the, both the employer and the employee are receiving right now? Yeah, I think that, um, I think it's really depends on the company's strategy, right? Mm -hmm. So managing people that are, that are working at different locations. So for example, executive leadership consulting has always been virtual. I've always had um, everybody working from home or working at client sites, right? So, so I never saw because we were mostly with clients. 
never really saw the reason to have an office and bring people in. And I attracted a lot of people with families, like people who, you know, I live in Los Angeles, so people who didn't like commuting and, um, and, and they saw a lot of freedom in being able to work from home and found themselves more uh, productive. But at the same time, you have to put into place, into place collaboration time, right? So that it's not, um, it's not that everybody's working independently, you have to drive more clarity when people aren't together in an office. You have to be intentional about connecting with them as humans, right? Not mm -hmm. just jumping into a meeting and jumping right into business, but actually connecting and having a conversation. How are you doing? What did you do this weekend? Right? Those types of things that you would have, those conversations that you would have in the office. And I think I think that is what the benefit of coming together in person brings is there's there's an energy that happens when we're together in person, right? So that so that we can um, come up with more innovative ideas and we can understand each other better. We can build trust, not to say that you can't remotely, but it's faster when you're in person. Um, so one of our clients actually did something. We were working with them when things started to open back up. We were working on them, with them on their strategy and their culture and things like that. So when things started to open back up, they asked us for help. What are we going to do? Right? How do we come back? And um, so we just interviewed the employees and or, or surveyed them and asked them what they wanted. What do you, what do you, what do you want? Do you want to work from home? Do you want to work in the office? Most of them said they wanted to work from home, um, but they understood the value of coming together for collaboration. So that company actually said, okay, well, we're going to have three days a month, every single month where the whole company is together. And that's when we have our team meetings and our all hands meetings. And, and we all come together and this, you know, the leadership team does their strategy work in those, those three days. Everybody comes together. Nobody can take vacation during those three days. Be the, the whole calendar for the year is published at the beginning of the year. So everybody knows in advance and then anybody can call for an in-person meeting anytime they want to. Right. So if, if we do need to come together, at least with a week notice, because people have, you know, to make plans if they need to commute or whatever, um, that they, anybody can call for that and ask ask for everybody to come together. And it's been so successful for them because they they come together when they need to. They have the flexibility and freedom to work from home um, as well. And and it's worked out really great. Um, when you're approached, is it is it typically human resources office department or is it the CEO? And um, what are the typical presenting issues that companies have when they recognize the benefit of your services? Yeah, it's usually there. Um, sometimes it's the CEO that wants to grow and they can't get their people on the same page um, or, you know, aligned. If it's a bigger company, it often happens to be um, misalignment, right? So, so we have the bigger the company, the more the politics, right? <laughs> right. So, so how do you help get everybody on the same page aligned to our strategy and where we're going? Does everybody understand it? Is it clear? Do we, do they really, uh, not only are they bought in, but is it clear to them? And that's one of the things that I do when I come into a company, if I have a chance to go into their office, I'll just ask like five random people. So what's the vision of the company and see if I get the same answers in their own words, right? It doesn't have, if they're parroting it, that tells me something, right? Mm -hmm. But if they're um, if they're actually able to articulate it in their own words, that tells me they really own it. Um, so business owners can do that, right? They can they can just ask their their um, ask their employees, you know, what do you think our purpose is? What do you think our vision is? And see what they say, and if and that's how they can kind of do a, a pressure test on are they aligned. And sometimes we do, um, depends on the size of the company. Sometimes we'll come in through the CEO. Sometimes we'll come in through somebody else on the leadership team that wants to do something with their individual team. And then sometimes we come in with human resources on, you know, they want to have some kind of leadership development program or they want executive coaching. It just depends, you know, what what the presenting issues are for the company and how they reach out to us. Got you. Um, want to pause right there and again remind you guys Randy Wilson podcast you can find this podcast everywhere podcasts are played but I'm going to encourage you to go over to YouTube so you can meet the beautiful Sonia Shelton today and learn more about executive leadership consulting um, this show is also powered through spin 100 FM here in Richmond and you will learn more about that where you can access this show uh, 
through Apple and iTunes. We're working on that as well. So uh, again, just want to make sure I plug that because I know we have some, we'll have some new listeners from the West Coast checking us out uh, as a result of talking with Sonia Shelton. Is your is your business, I think I read that you have national, you, you're not just California based, you're national, international, if I'm correct, right? And I mean, I'm yes, your best selling author. I would imagine that your network is pretty, pretty big. Okay. Yes, um, yes. I want to go back more, real, real quick, though, before we go jump too far forward, because I'm really interested in that Disney experience. I'm really interested mm. in that because, um, t- just tell me about your story. Tell me about your experience with Disney. Uh, you, you was there for seven years. Did you come in and did you stay in the same position? Did you grow? Um, I'm just curious because I hear that the ingredients that people are able to gain in that in that experience really can contribute to them doing phenomenal things such as you've done. So share with me a little bit about that. Yes, absolutely. I I had, you know, I, I started in employee communications. I did grow and, and it grew into the um, actually the head of employee communications for the corporate Walt Disney Company worldwide, right? So I was in, in charge of, um, you know, hundreds of thousands of employees, communications, and I did learn so much. And I and I and and I'll say that because I was in my position as the head of internal communications at a time where nobody in my position experienced what I experienced, and nobody in that position will ever experience that again. And that was, um, we had a shareholder revolt where a member of the Disney family led a shareholder revolt against our CEO at the time. So it was Roy Disney led the shareholder revolt against our CEO, Michael Eisner. So I saw both sides, right? I saw the the culture that everybody knows Disney for and uh, having that great place to work and really having that strong culture that that everybody is excited to move forward. And I also saw the worst of it which was, you know, basically a company going through a divorce. And, you know, and, and in my position, you know, basically they're saying, well, keep everybody focused on why they want to work here and, and keep them focused on being productive. And it's like, mm-hmm. okay, right. So, um, it, so I, re- and I, re- I really got political and it wasn't, it wasn't a great place to work during that time. And I, and I think that, um, especially in my position and what I learned uh, really was about my own leadership first in being in that challenging situation, being in that politics, being in that stressful situation and how, what was happening to me, I then passed on to my team. And afterwards recognized that I had done that. And, and, you know, and, and it really made me have empathy for leaders, right? When we're going through challenging times, which is, you know, these days, all the time, right? Because things are so uncertain, so challenging for for anybody in business right now, um, and especially in healthcare, right? So, so that there can be a tendency to just pass on what we're receiving, but as leaders, we need to sort of be that buffer, and and help drive the drive those challenges solutions up, um, up in the organization while keeping our team protected from that and not passing it on and ended up creating my own culture within my team, but also, you know, just saw the, the impact of culture through those experiences on the good and the the best and the worst, right. Of, of both sides of Disney and um, really showed me that, that this can be really powerful in a company. And because when I, I can tell you when the Walt Disney company was rallied behind something, it was magic. Right. Um, and and when the whole company was pushing towards an objective or pushing towards a goal, it was amazing to see the things that they would create and and it really created a lot of energy. Um, so so I really that what's that's why I'm so passionate about helping companies do that for themselves is to say, really, you can when you get your people aligned to where you want to go, they will bring amazing ideas that you didn't even think of and they'll get you there faster. They, they just need that clarity and that passion to help you get there. Is it fair to say that this, this is that where the seed was planted for you to go into entrepreneurship? hundred percent. Well, yeah, I would say in this company, yes, yeah. but I actually grew up with entrepreneurs. My, my, mm-hmm. both my parents had their own company. So I, um, so I kind of grew up with it, although I swore as a child that I would never do what they did. 
mm-hmm. <laughs> um, but I guess I started more more in the creative um, creative space. Yeah, I uh, I didn't realize how much I learned from them almost by osmosis because they were having those hard conversations about running a business at dinner conversations they couldn't have in the office. Right. So I really learned in retrospect, I really learned a lot from them in listening to those conversations, even though at the time I thought it was super boring. (laughs) (laughs) So, yeah, I got, I got to ask these questions because these are the things that's kind of, I mean, the Forbes thing is pretty impressive. The you're on the Forbes coaching council. What is that? Yeah, so it's um it's a community of executive coaches that Forbes has brought in to help basically for thought leadership. So we're we're able to write articles for Forbes and uh, about leadership and and kind of share with um, the broader business community, you know, our ideas and and things like that through through the Forbes brand, which has been amazing, and uh, they're super supportive of what we do. How did you get identified for that, or did you apply? To, to, how how did that? I mean, that doesn't fall on everybody's lap and I'm sure, you know, everyone just can't, there's a tons of consultants out there that probably would love that opportunity. How did that, how was that created for you? Yeah. Um, they reached out to me. Somebody had nominated me to, Mm -hmm. to be on the council and then I did have to apply. You have to go through an application process, um, and then continue to, uh, to, to continue to with them, you also have to continue to, to show that you're, that you're a thought leader in the industry for sure. Active. Yeah. Um, we're nosy over here at the Randy Wilson podcast. If you yeah, no mind. problem. So, so <laughs> because it's Forbes, I would imagine they probably pay you for this. They do not. They don't. We, no, we you we cheap, actually. You <laughs> cheap. <mother. laughs> What we we benefit so much from that Forbes brand that mm-hmm. um that they see they they think it's worth it for us to do it. I'm sure it, it, uh, sure it being is. Paid for sure, yeah. Sure it is. I'm, I mean, I'm. I mean, just being able to have it on your resume probably is probably open can open up so many doors and turn so many heads but I, I had to ask that question um and so you you're also a part of an association of executive consultants as well correct yes tell me that tell me that association again it's the association of corporate executive coaches mm-hmm. um, or ACEC and it's um it's an amazing group of more higher higher level executive coaches that um they they have a certification process to make sure you really have to show that you're a business partner with a company not just coming in and uh checking the box or or coaching with somebody you actually have to sh- to demonstrate that you're actually helping to move the business forward in the work that you do so like i i'm i'm asking this question ignorantly i don't know like I don't know the different scale. Like there's, there's, I don't know the different levels and scales of executive consultants. I don't, you know, like Mm -hmm. I know, I know. Yeah. I I just don't. I mean, I know people who do what you do, but I don't know what scale you are on in comparison to them. Can you, can you, I mean, brag on yourself. It's okay. Okay. I want you to help me understand, help, help us understand the levels of, I mean, cause I noticed you said you work with very broad, you can work with a lot of different people, but I'm sure with a lot of different skills, a lot of different projects, but, and you have a team of consultants to work with you that allows right. you to, so can you help us with the scale? Cause I, you seem like the person who's also involved in the development and leadership of the consultants. So like, where do you get involved? Like what, where's your focus at versus your team's focus? Just talk a little bit about how you strategize because within your organization, there's a bunch of consultants. And so I'm curious of like what you're working on versus maybe what they're working on too. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Nosy. So I know I'll, I'm nosy. I'll, Sorry. Very nosy. Yeah, no, no problem. I love it. I love it. So the, the, I would say the important thing about, you talked about the levels of consultants and I, and I wouldn't say that it's about experience. Right. I think I mentioned earlier some of the big consulting firms, um, you know, people might know like McKinsey or Deloitte or, you know, some of some of the big um, consulting firms. They're great places for people to come in and and learn how to be a consultant. Right. So um, they're also really expensive and a lot of out of reach for a lot of companies. And they're also um even for the companies that do hire them, they look at, well, what are they really bringing as far as results, right? They bringing a lot of thought leadership research, um, but are they really helping us grow the business? So I really look at, you know, what, 
what is the impact, right? So, so at ELC, our number one value is partnership. So we're just as invested in your success as a business as you are. In some cases, we've been more invested, right? Right. So, so because uh, we, if we see, can, if we can see the potential, we get super excited about that and, right. and see what you can create. And I don't think a lot of consultants do that. Right. I think a lot of consultants are, you know, they're, they're coming in, they're bringing their expertise, their knowledge. Um, they're, they're maybe coaching you through the process, but it's just, you know, another client for them. Um, and that's not how we work. We really, we really want to have, you know, our why is to make an impact, right? So, so we really want to see that we can impact the business that we're working with or the executive that we're working with. And, um, and we actually will turn down clients if they don't want to grow, right? So if we can see, well, they, they're looking to fix some problems, but they're not really looking to grow or they don't really want to change, we'll turn them down and say, no, no, we're not the right fit for you because we we want to really help work with people that are going to move the needle and and have an impact and we and we want to help businesses do that and so i think for for me um i look at as w- what i do versus what other other people on the team do is really what i'm most excited about right so if i really get excited about complex problems right so um so things that are are big challenges, I love to get involved with. And then sometimes it'll be just the company that I'm interested in. Or I, I'm super curious about what they do. So I want to get involved with with um, with what they're doing. And that's kind of how I choose where I play. Gotcha. Gotcha. You mentioned Deloitte. My brother used to contract for Deloitte. He's in IT recruiting. And uh, mm-hmm. I, learned, I wasn't really familiar with them until he started working there. And then I, rec- I learned how big they were. So as you mentioned that name, um, do you, do you consider, I don't know how large your company is, uh, do you, but you, you did say that you, I mean, is it, do you compete with them? Do you, I mean, you're at the, are you at, you're at tables where they have representatives as well. And I guess you're sometimes bidding for the same business. And so, yeah, it really depends on the size of the company, right? So for mm-hmm. bigger companies, sometimes we are in competition. Sometimes we collaborate. Right. So sometimes they're taking a bigger piece and we're looking more at the people side or help. How, okay. how do they help? So so for an IT, for example, we've done a lot of partnering with bigger consulting companies as they're doing more of the technology change and the systems change and the process change. And we're looking at the people change. So how do we get people to adopt this new technology? How do we help them move forward with uh, with all the change in a way that's not so disruptive to them or the business. Um, so, so it's, you know, and sometimes we're competing, sometimes we're partnering. Um, but you know, my philosophy is not about competition. I think that there's, it's really about, there's plenty out there for everybody and we can, we can actually partner and collaborate sometimes. And, um, and if not, there's always, there's always more companies to work with. Do you ever work with mental health companies? Um, I have, yes, I have. Yeah. What, What, what have you seen? What, what's been, I'm just curious, like what's been a, has it been, has it been out, other than growth, what have you seen that mental health companies have had a need for? You know, I think it's really about um, a few things. And, and I think that mental health companies are in more of the front of this, but I think a lot of companies are experiencing it right now. And that's a lot of stress and burnout, mm-hmm. right? So, um, so the mental health companies are supporting the people who are experiencing that too. Yeah. Right. And, and are they really looking at how are they supporting their people too? Right. So those people, you know, it's, it's like the, the, they're the people supporting, maybe we forget that they also need support yeah. and, um, and looking at, you know, how, how are you creating wins for them so that they feel like they're, um, they're moving things forward. You know, I think sometimes, especially in this environment where there's, um, there just seems to be more growing mental health issues and it can feel like a tidal wave that you can't get ahead of. Um, and, and I can, I can see where, you know, people start to get to what's the point, right? Like we can never get ahead of this. Right. So I, th- I think that, um, you know, it's really, I think in anything in healthcare, it's really making sure that you're helping to reignite their passion for what they do. They already have that purpose. They wouldn't be there if they didn't have it, right? So they have that purpose, but how can you continue to reignite that passion, make sure that they're getting the support that they need for 
how do they deal with the stress that they're that they're going through that they're helping other people through too and then ultimately um you know just remembering setting milestones and things where they can have small wins right i think yeah. that a lot of burnout is is created because we feel like we're on this treadmill yeah. and we're just running with no destination and even if you can't get to that vision of you know um bigger vision that a mental health company might have as far as having that impact what are some small wins that you can celebrate along the way to help help them feel like they are making a difference and they're they're moving things forward yeah yeah you know a lot of times with the individuals who work in mental health companies they get involved in the industry because of one they want to help someone then they grow and they grow into roles where their job is no longer to help but it's to supervise or to manage or direct and so um, I think it's challenging sometimes for mental health professionals, particularly because they're helping industry professionals, but when, but when they develop in their roles or in their, in their career and they're no longer helping the direct the client, and it's now more about supervising the staff, they got to switch. They got to know how to turn that switch. You know, a lot of human service professionals are nurturers. Mm-hmm. Um, Boundaries are an area that always have to be practiced, you know, and it can yeah. get really challenging when you have to come to terms of understanding that your staff is not your client. You got to right. hold them accountable, you know, yes, otherwise, absolutely. otherwise you're enabling the situation and it's a downward effect that it, it ends up happening, you know, affecting the clients and, you know, mental health is, uh, it's obviously important, just like physical health and spiritual health and, you know, nutritional health is, it is one of those things that is, you often hear a lot about it. Um, in Virginia, unfortunately, we're number 48 in the country in mental health. Wow. And, um, uh, we have plenty of money. We just don't, we just don't spend it in the area as always it's needed, but, uh, I am hopeful. I am hopeful that things are a shift's turning and, and maybe things are going to get a little bit better. We, yeah, uh, and I think to, great to opportunity for you to come out here. Great opportunity for you to come out here and help. <laughs> yes, absolutely. And when I think I want to just talk about that accountability piece, because I think sometimes um, when the when leaders are coming from that place of service, they think that that's not holding people accountable or not putting that discipline in place. Um, But if we look at the research during the Great Resignation, the number one reason why people left their company or what they were looking for in a new company was they were looking for a company that was well-led and headed in the right direction. So if you don't, if they don't have clarity, like you think you're helping them by letting them do what they want to do or by not holding them accountable or being too nice, right? (laughs) Right. Mm -hmm. It's, but they actually want that. They want, they want clarity. What does success look like? They want to know what they need to do to be successful and, and that, and where we're going as a company, what are we trying to achieve? They want that. And so, so for those leaders that are, that are thinking that maybe they, they, it's hard to hold people accountable, giving them, giving people that clarity helps to uh, ensure that they're moving in the right direction. And in some cases, you know, I say clarity polarizes in some cases they might not be in the right role. And that's okay. There's nothing wrong with that, right? Like it's it's better to to let them fi- figure that out so that they can go somewhere where they can be successful than it is to try to um, for for everybody to be unhappy with them not being successful. So it sounds to me like you shared some of what I would imagine would be part of like they defining the leader to some degree. Like distinguish the difference between the executive and the leader, if you can. Yeah. So I so I don't think there's a difference. I think that, that one is a role. And one is a behavior, right? So you can be both, right? Okay. <laughs> right. So the name of my book is you're an executive, but are you a leader? Because I saw so many executives um, and business owners leading from their title, right? I'm the boss and yeah. you just need to do what I say, right? Yeah. Um, so it's almost the flip side of what we were just talking about mm-hmm. and and saying, well, because I'm in this, I have this title, then you have to listen to me. Well, you know, you get, you can get that but it's, you'll get compliance, not engagement and definitely not passion. Right. So, so when it's really looking at, you know, are you a leader means, do you have that clear direction? Do we know where we're going? Do we know why we're going there? And are people following you? (laughs) Right. If you don't have that alignment where they're, where they're following you in that direction, 
Um, that's what you really need to be looking at. And you don't have to have an executive title to be a leader. You can be a leader at any level of the organization. Yes, um, even as an individual contributor, you can help, you can help lead people. Yeah. I tell people all the time that, you know, you lead, you can lead, you lead people in the door and you lead people out the door. Leadership can be, um, it can come from, it can come from, it can come from any area. It can come from above. It can come from below. Um, Sometimes the person who may be the, at the bottom of the totem pole or, or the hierarchy of the organization could be one of the most incredible leaders because of how they influence somebody's attitude from the start of the day, you know? So, uh, yeah, I could talk all day about that. I, I, I had this coach one time, he was a leadership coach, and he spoke a lot about getting individuals to understand that first the leadership starts within themselves. You know, we are the CEOs of our life of our life. You know, we, we, we're responsible for making the executive decisions on how we govern and our household. And we, that leads us to being the CFOs of our life. Now, that doesn't mean that we don't need a financial advisor, but at the end of the day, we are the chief financial officer for our life, you know, and, and that correlates over to everything else from the nutritionists. You know, we feed ourselves. <laughs> we we're responsible for putting that spoon and fork in our mouth. Um, Granted, we may have a dietitian who works with us on, on our things, but in every aspect from fitness to emotional well-being to mental health, it's the leadership starts with them, starts with you. And um, I've always remember, I've always thought about that in, in situations where I, I struggled in managing the control or lack of control that I've had in certain situations, I've just always came back to remembering what am I what am I most responsible for right now in my life? And I think there's a lot of individuals who have thought about, who have been required to think about that as a result of COVID because COVID has been for a lot of people the, so impactful to their life, you know, from changing jobs to a loss of family to just like, regardless of how a person looks at COVID or not. Okay. And I'm, not, you know, I'm not here to be political on COVID. I, I mean, like, you know, regardless of how you see COVID or the flu, whatever people have, it's changed. It has been a whirlwind of change that people have experienced in life because their jobs changed and we, it was stuck up in the house and business, everything changed around us, you know? And I think that it gave people an opportunity to think <laughs> about themselves and their purpose and their, and, and their direction focus. And so I know I kind of want to rant there a little bit, but, um, you yeah, they, I, I love what you said there, because I think that one of the things that I see um, as a coach on the coach side of, of what I do is that a lot of people think they don't have agency. They don't have a choice. Right. So um, especially, you know, the higher you move, move with an organization or the longer that you're with a company that you think that you don't have choices. Right. Like I have to do this. I don't like this job, but I have to do this. Um, and exactly what you're saying, when you recognize that you're the CEO of your own life, then you can decide, okay, what's my personal vision? Yeah. Where is it that I want to go? And who's the team I need to su yeah. support me to get there, right? Yeah. So so I'm directing that team, my yeah. personal team, whether it's, you know, it's nutritionist. You're a general or, manager too. You didn't know it. Yeah. You're a franchise owner. You own your own. That's right. You build your team. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> you, can but, like, um, you don't have to recruit and, a team. You can build it yourself, you know? Exactly. Mm -hmm. Exactly. You can, you know, you maybe you have, you know, a uh, um, somebody that that helps you with fitness somebody yeah. that helps you with nutrition somebody that helps you with mental health right yeah. that that you can build your own team around mm -hmm. your life to help you get where you want to go um but it's really looking at having that vision of what do you want your life to look like first and getting that clarity um and then of course we always start with why right so we we agree with the author Simon Sinek about starting with why mm -hmm. um and so, so we always help start even with an individual on what is your personal why, um, and then how do you bring that why to life, and what do you, what can other people expect from you, and then from there, when you know what your superpower is, then you can create a vision for your life, and then you can create a vision for your company. Pretty, and in, in, in hearing you say that, it, it's, it you clearly have the experience because you did it yourself. Yeah, you did it yourself. You know, I'd always, I, I joke with people and. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm being honest, but I'm using humor. Okay. I'm arguably like one of the best basketball players you probably ever had a conversation with. And, 
<laughs> I even laugh myself when I say it, but I say all that to say that team team oriented, like you you have to be able to know the value of yourself and know the value of what role that you can play in a team mm -hmm. and also what role that you can together collaboratively, the impact that you can have on society. And um, I've always been more motivated as a, as a player, as an athlete coming up to follow the guidance when someone was able to show it to me. Mm -hmm. It's easy. Like you can tell me something all day, but if I can see it, I'll learn, I'll learn better. And uh, that's happening in sports right now. I don't know if you're a sports person, but there's a reason in sports why the industry of, communications as far as like media is changing like former athletes are now you know working are the are the top journalists and broadcasters for the major networks because they also have degrees in communication as well and and they can speak it but they can also share their their previous experiences and so um yeah I, I got a couple more questions here and then as we wrap toward the end i'll do some rapid fire little spontaneous impulsive I don't think about what I'm going to ask you type of questions just to help the audience get a little bit more familiar with the random things about Sonia that may not be in your bio. Okay. We're getting to get there. Okay. okay? Sounds good. Sounds good. But I'm curious uh, right now on this date, particularly like this moment right now, what, what are the, what are things that leaders of organizations, what are, uh, what's the areas where they can have, make the biggest impact right now? Is there, is there a couple particular things that you feel like they can do? Yeah, I think that that um, I would say two big things. One is to recognize that, you know, we're in an unprecedented time. There's a lot of uncertainty, and things are moving really fast, right? So, so I think that the pace of change doesn't matter what industry you're in. Everybody that we talk to feels like, well, we don't really know what's going to happen. We can't plan too far in advance because we don't really know what's going to happen, and there's everything's moving so fast. That's why we can't plan. And, and it's recognizing that that's real, right? It's, it's real for you. It's real for your team. The, if we can embrace that, that's where we are um, and not try to fight it or make it different. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right. Um, and, and also share with your team, like we get it. We're going to have to, we're, things are changing. We might have to pivot. We're headed in this direction. And this is what we want to create we think we have an idea of how we're going to get there, but as things change, how we get there might change mm -hmm. and that's okay. There's nothing wrong with that. Right. It's, it's starting to make that change normal for people is, is going to, um, to help them be more productive and, and reduce some of the stress, which brings me to the second thing, which is really recognizing that, you know, um, I think it was the American Institute of stress said that 94% of employees are experiencing stress at work. And I don't remember the exact number. It was like 60 something percent of employees say they wanted to leave their job because of the stress that they're having. And that's real. And that it really, that hurts my heart to hear that because that's, it doesn't have to be like that. Um, and really looking at how can you create more clarity and more purpose behind what you're doing as a company and as a leader um, to, to help to reduce some of that stress. Cause a lot of that is coming from a lack of clarity or not understanding why. So um, are those some of the trends that you're, you're currently seeing in the workplace? I, I, so yeah. um, what, what's so different than is it, have we just got, have we just got like so much, you know, more intelligent or, or is there something different between today's modern day employee and let's say an employee 20 years ago in the workplace? Like what's the difference? Oh my gosh, just think about how much information you consume in a day, right? Um, between the internet, social media, television, like the, um, people, right? Like mm -hmm. your text messages, like emails, like all these things yeah. are coming at you all the time, right? Mm -hmm. And um, and now we have AI, right? <laughs> right? Where oh, people gosh, are talking know, about <laughs> like other technologies that are going to change how people, it's going to change how people work. Right. And they're looking yeah. at that and saying, Oh, where are we going? What's happening? So, yeah, I think that, that we're definitely, um, you know, to today's worker is really taking in a lot more information and communication, like you said. And, yeah. and if there isn't clarity to be able to get focused on where you're going, then there's a lot of like going back and forth and a lot of reactivity, which creates more stress. And, um, 
Whereas when you're focused and clear, then you you can start to um, eliminate some things, right? To say, I don't I don't need to look at that. I don't need to listen to that. I don't need to focus on that. I, just, I know where I'm going and I know what I need to do. Um, and just being present with that and, and on a day-to-day -day basis, because it might change, right? But to be able to be present and say, okay, this is this is my job right now. This is what I need to do. Everything else can fall away. But leaders need to help people with that. Yeah, yeah. Sonia, you've been you've been great. It's been a great conversation, and I I want to have more conversation with you. Uh, before we get off and before we close, I, I want you to stay on the, on the call just so we can talk a little further. Um, but what I like to do toward the end of my shows, I like to ask some random questions. Um, sometimes I often ask the same random questions. Sometimes I'm in some you know I, I hear something that tells me to ask something else. And these there's no thought, you know. This is all for fun and. You know, these are probably questions that your friends and family know, but there may be things that other people who know you but don't know you that well would be like, oh, I didn't know that she listened to Boy George when she was, you know, riding in the car and <laughs> things like that. So um, chicken or fish? Chicken. Chicken. So mm -hmm. you're not one of those folks who just stopped eating meat and went vegan or vegetarian all of a sudden. No. You're, you're still eating no. chicken. You're still. Yeah. Is it got is fried, I, grilled, baked? Does it have does it matter or just chicken? Chicken. You have just chicken. I like chicken. I, I like fish too, but I, yeah. I think I eat more chicken. Um and yes, I did. I this is a funny story because I did try to be vegetarian for a little while and yeah. my body didn't like it. And yeah. so I just brought back poultry and seafood for a yeah. while. Yeah. Um, but then last year I a nutritionist on my team yeah. suggested that I bring back beef and pork, which I hadn't had for almost for over 25 years. Yeah. And um and I actually feel better, right? <laughs> so. It's interesting. I've been there. I've been there because I needed iron or something that I wasn't getting elsewhere and the body is an interesting thing and you know, I, I've learned that listen, everyone can't jump on a popular fad just because that's what's going on. You got to give your body what your body needs and Yeah. You better listen to your body because if you don't, it will <laughs> it'll continue to make sure that it gets your attention. Um When you was young, Sonia, are, are you a, are you married with children, family person? Uh, married and and lots of kids. We don't have children of our own, but lots mm -hmm. of kids that we help with. Okay, so I'm talking about pre marriage. I'm not. So I don't want because I I I don't want to disrupt the family here. I believe in the union of marriage, but I'm talking about when you was a young, young, you know, younger because you're already young, but younger. Okay? <laughs> <laughs> I make sure I'm right. Thanks for that. Thanks. For Thank that. you. You're already young. Yeah, but younger. Okay, and you know. <laughs> Who is your who is your uh, celebrity crush? It hasn't changed, okay. and your listeners might not know him, but he's um is he's he's a singer named Sammy Hagar. He used to be the lead singer of Van Halen back in the day, um, and had a crush since I was thirteen years old, and I have it still today. Okay. <laughs> Watch out, Mister Shelton. That's all I'm gonna say. Watch out. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> So when you're in the car driving, are you are you listening to radio? Are you listening to podcasts? Are you listening to self help books? What are you listening to? All of it. Yeah. Um, it just depends. Kind of, I I love. I believe in personal development. So, mm -hmm. um, so when I'm in the car, so it just depends on my mood, right? If I want to relax, I'll listen to music. I love music. Mm -hmm. um, also, you know, want to keep learning and developing, so I'll listen to podcasts and audiobooks and yeah. uh, all of it. Yeah. Cool. Cool. Where is your favorite vacation place? Cabo San Lucas, Mexico. Gotcha. Yeah. So, so I haven't been there. I just got back from Mexico not too long ago, but you said San, San Lucas? Cabo San Lucas. Yes. It's um, it's right at the tip of Baja, California. And okay. on one side, it has the Pacific Ocean. Okay. And on the other side, it has the Sea of Cortez um, and beautiful rock formations. And uh, it's just a great place. And, and so what makes it so what, what makes it your favorite? I think I love I love the ocean. I mm -hmm. love being by water. Mm -hmm. Um I also love the culture of Mexico. So mm -hmm. I grew up in New Mexico. Okay. And so, you know, having that Mexican sort of more relaxed, um, more in the moment kind of, of mm -hmm. vibe I really yep. like. Um gotcha. and it's a great place to decompress, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> to and 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 also, you know, there's a lot of celebration and and having fun too. Gotcha. Gotcha. Are you, um, are you, uh, 
so you you said you were was born in you was born in New Mexico. You currently live in L.A. Mm-hmm. Was it a what was the what was the why is it was it because of career opportunities? Yeah, I grew up in a in Santa Fe, New Mexico, and when I was growing up, you had pretty much two choices of career: you could work for the state, mm-hmm. or you could be in tourism. And neither of them those were appealing to me. I wanted I actually wanted to be a rock and roll journalist, so yeah. that brought me to L.A. <laughs> gotcha, gotcha. <laughs> so- yeah, you shared before the show because I told you I have a lot of creatives. Uh, do you see your oppor- Do you see your work now correlate over? Like, are you able? Do you do any work in the entertainment industry? Yeah, yeah. I think I I have a passion still for for creatives, and um, you know, I think one of the things that creatives struggle with is business, right? And right. how to how to recognizing that doesn't matter what you want to do. You're a musician. You're an artist. Doesn't matter what you want to do. Um, you still, there's a, still a business component to it. Right. And it's, I love working with artists to figure out like, how can they create a business around what they love to do and, and get their work out there more so that they can share it. Right. That's ultimately when you're an artist, you don't want to keep it to yourself. You want to share what you're, what you're working on. Right. So the more people that can see it, the bigger impact that you can have and more lucrative, of course. You know, I think what would be great, and you may already have it out there, but like, I think so many artists need a YouTube, before they can get to you, they're going to have to, they need a, they need a, like a YouTube video of, or something that can give them a step toward just creating income, right. <laughs> like first, like, because they're not going to be able to afford, uh, you know, that's the challenge I see. I see a lot of amazing talent, a lot of amazing talents and creative people, and they're creating all day, but they're putting on you know, the back burner the fact that they need to create a way to have a pot to pee in and maybe even build a, a box around them. Like they're, leaving on, they're sleeping on someone's couch or they're living in someone's basement. And so you're right. They they do need someone to help get them in a place of, of that, but they get manipulated through the process so much in, through their talents and they never get to a place to, to be able to afford, you know, the right person who can help them because we're in a, we're in a time now where people don't want to do anything for free. So right. like how, you know, so like how that would be a whole nother session, a whole nother conversation, how to help their creative create the opportunity. Cause I think a lot of times they're looking to create a network of people who, they, mm-hmm. who they'll find complimentary so that they can all kind of work together. But then through that process, sometimes you got to like, you still, you got to limit, you know, you, you figure out this ain't working. So it's just, it's constantly over and over. And now you're 40 and you're still right. trying to play the guitar and make it. And it's like, huh, maybe I'll just go join a band now. <laughs> right. <know. laughs> it's it's interesting though. It's interesting. It's, it's a process just like in anything else though. But um, Sonia, you've been, and and I hope that during this show, I never called you Susan. I no, don't you know didn't. If I did or not. I didn't. didn't. Because <laughs> I want to call you Susan for some reason. I really want to call you Susan, but you're, it's Sonia. I apologize. That's okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's been phenomenal having you on the show, and it's been phenomenal to speak to those listeners out there who may have not been familiar with the Randy Wilson podcast show. Um, you can find this podcast everywhere podcasts are played Stitcher, Libsyn, uh, Spotify, Apple, Google Play. Those are the places I would go. Um, or YouTube. You can definitely go over to randywilsonpodcast.com. If you're listening to the show or Sonia, you can also think about this and you know someone who you think would be a phenomenal guest for our show, please suggest them. Inbox me and someone from our team will follow up. Sonia, please, before we go, drop your social media, drop information on how people can find, find out more about you and any closing comments that you have. Yes, absolutely. I'm active on Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn. So any of those places, I check them myself. So um, be sure to follow me. You can send me a private message if you want to, DM me if you have questions. Um, And then executiveleader.com is our website. And we have lots of free resources on there, probably, well, hundreds of, of articles and other downloadable resources to help you in your leadership. Great. Thank you so much, Sonia. I really appreciate having you on the show. Thank you. It was great. I loved our conversation. Thank you very much. Again, this was episode 100 and something. I don't know exactly. I think it's 117, 118. We're in the hundreds, okay? So we're established, okay? 
And uh, we hope you've enjoyed the show. Remember to hit the subscribe button, hit the follow button, and stay tuned for our next exciting guest.